staff has been instructed not to mute members except when a member is not being recognized and there is inadvertent background noise. Members are reminded that they may only participate in one remote proceeding at a time. If you are participating today, please keep your camera on. And if you choose to attend a different remote proceeding, please turn your camera off. This hearing is entitled Beyond iRobot, Ethics, Artificial Intelligence, and the Digital Age. And I now recognize myself for four minutes to give an opening statement. Thank you everyone for joining us today at a time when the power and perils of AI are very much on people's minds. Each generation has its own cautionary tales about AI. Recent big screen adaptations, The Matrix, Terminator, and Tron echoed the episodes of the old 1960s Star Trek, starring William Shatner as Captain James T. Kirk of the Starship Enterprise. Uh, those episodes were themselves taken from the short stories of Isaac Asimov, Arthur Clarke, and all the old masters of 1950s sci-fi pulp magazines. And parenthetically, I should offer our congratulations that today William Shatner Shatner was able to boldly go into suborbital near space, where X-15 pilots have been boldly going since the late 1950s. But I digress. Asimov's classic, iRobot, showed us what can happen when we deploy technology or AI without fully comprehending its consequences. There's an ancient joke in AI that I first heard as an undergraduate back in the 1970s about an all-powerful AI that was given a simple command, maximize paperclip production. It then thought about it for a moment and then began killing off all humans on Earth because, well, uh, humans interfere with paperclip production. Now, it may have taken us 50 years, but we're kind of there. Facebook's AI was given the simple command, maximize Facebook's profits, whereupon they thought for a moment and then began killing off all rational political debate in our country because, well, that interferes with Facebook's profits. And the situations with social media in Myanmar and around the world are even uglier and more deadly. In previous hearings of this task force, we have looked at the biases and unexpected side effects of using AI in financial services and housing. We've also looked at the implications of artificial intelligence's voracious appetite for personal data and the implications for privacy. Uh, technological approaches to maximally preserve privacy while remaining retaining AI's effectiveness and the importance of secure digital identity. In this hearing, we're going to take a closer look at the frameworks for developing, monitoring, and regulating AI to ensure the technology we develop and deploy will be of overall benefit to society. In past hearings, we've examined instances of algorithmic bias that have produced discriminatory effects in the lending space. We've seen facial recognition technology that's far less effective at identifying minorities correctly, uh, despite the fact that the developers of these tools did not include a discriminatory line of code in their products. So we clearly cannot allow technology to treat humans differently based on race or appearance, unless, of course, uh, perhaps we are explicitly correcting for past unjust biases, which brings, us, brings up a set of issues that my father struggled with as a civil rights lawyer back in the 1950s and continues with us today. Uh, we have to understand whether we should hold AI to standards that are higher than we would ordinarily expect of ordinary human-based decision-making processes. As we start defining frameworks for developing and performance testing AI, it seems possible that we're starting to place requirements on AI that are more strict than we would ever place on human decision makers. Uh, for example, uh, most of our witnesses today have advocated for defining minimum diversity standards for the training data sets for AI, but we'd never consider requiring that a human bank officer would have a minimum number of friends of different races or protected classes even though it might arguably result in more fair decision making. As, and we all may already be seeing the positive results of holding AI to higher standards than humans, with the recent reports that fintech apps were apparently more effective than human-based banks in issuing PPP loans to minority customers. As policymakers, we also have to understand to what extent that we, we should concentrate on so-called black box testing that only focuses on the input and outputs from opaque neural network and other decision-making uh, algorithms, or whether we should expect ourselves and the public to, to receive and to understand a detailed explanation of what goes on under the hood. So there's a lot to be examined here. It's my hope that this dialogue will, uh, in this dialogue, we will discover which frameworks exist and which should be created or fleshed out to ensure that AI is working effectively and, the, and safely for everyone. 
And the chair will now recognize the ranking member of the task force, Mr. Gonzalez of Ohio, for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Foster, for your leadership on ethics and AI and, and for convening today's hearing and witnesses. Uh, it is vital that Congress continues to consider how we can best promote innovative advancement in the private sector while also ensuring AI is both transparent and ethical. Today's hearing provides an opportunity to hear directly from industry experts and stakeholders on the importance of this topic. A few months ago, the task force held a similar hearing examining how human-centered AI can address systemic racism. One of our witnesses at that hearing, Professor Riyad Ghani of Carnegie Mellon University, testified that algorithms themselves are neither inherently biased or unbiased, but work by analyzing past data and making generalizations about future outcomes. I believe these discussions on bias and algorithms are important to have. We must acknowledge and recognize these technologies at times are not perfect due to the inherent nature of a technology created by humans. It is vital though that we do not take steps backwards by over-regulating this industry, which may have a chilling effect on the deployment of these technologies. If there are problems with AI and algorithms, we should not abandon our push to innovate and move forward. It is through further innovation that we are likely going to be able to fix these issues and to improve the technology. As Chairman Foster uh, recognized, we saw, we've seen the benefits uh, in the disbursement of PPP loans. I think that's, that's an important thing for us to, to keep in mind as, as we continue forward. We should also continue to work with the experts in industry in order to move forward in a bipartisan way that both celebrates the technological advancements and ensures that there is transparency and fairness through the use of artificial intelligence. There have been multiple efforts in the government and private sector to address this issue, and we have seen tremendous advances not only in, an, in AI technology, but also in efforts to address bias and algorithms internally. There is recognition of a business incentive to have transparent algorithms that are fair and ethical. Beyond the obvious concerns of ethics and transparency, I'm also looking forward to learning more today from our witnesses of ways that we can strengthen data transparency for families and consider reforms that would protect our children from being targeted by harmful algorithms. As the financial internet and the traditional internet merge, uh, and we've seen recently reported social media companies like TikTok employing algorithms that promote inappropriate content to users, to young users, uh, I think this is extremely troubling and extremely timely that we start to discuss these things. In an AI-powered world where parents have no control over what content or products are being fed to their kids, no transparency around the algorithms that are funneling the content, and no control over the underlying data itself is not an ideal outcome. In summary, AI has great promise to innovate industries like the financial services sector, but there are still opportunities to improve. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today how Congress should be thinking about this balance, and I yield back. Thank you, and the chair will now recognize the chairwoman of the full committee, the gentlewoman from California, for one minute. And it's my, or am I understanding that she's not able to make it right now? And so we will move on. Um, so today we welcome the testimony of our distinguished witnesses. Uh, first, we have Ms. Meredith Broussard, the Associate Professor, uh, Associate Professor Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute of New York University. And next, we'll have Ms. Mer Miriam Vogel, the president and CEO of Equal AI. Next, we have Ms. Meg King, the director of the Science and Technology Innovation Program at the Wilson Center. Next, we have Mr. Jeffrey Young, principal advisor at the Financial Stability Institute with the Bank of International Settlements. And last, we have Mr. Aaron Cooper, the vice president for global policy at BSA, the Software Alliance. Witnesses are reminded that their oral testimony will be limited to five minutes. You should be able to see a timer on your screen that indicates how much time you have left. And I would ask you to be mindful of the timer and quickly wrap up your testimony once the time has expired so that we can be respectful of both the witnesses and the committee members' time. Without objection, your written statement will be made part of the record. Ms. Broussard, you are now recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony. 
Thank you. Representative Foster, members of the task force, thank you for hosting this important hearing and for giving me the opportunity to testify. My name is Meredith Broussard. I'm a professor at NYU, the research director at the NYU Alliance for Public Interest Technology, and author of the book Artificial Unintelligence, How Computers Misunderstand the World. In my written testimony, I explore a practical vision for regulating AI. And in the short time, I'll talk about AI generally, as well as discrimination, algorithmic auditing, and regulatory sandboxes. First thing I wanna say is that AI is not what we see in Hollywood. There's no robot apocalypse coming. There's no singularity. We do not need to prepare for artificial general intelligence because these things are imaginary. What is real is that AI is math very complicated and beautiful math. Machine learning, the most popular kind of AI, is a poorly chosen term because it suggests that there's a brain or sentience inside the computer. There's not. When we do machine learning, we take a large set of historical data and instruct the computer to create a model based on patterns and values in that data set. The model can then be used to predict or make decisions based on past data. The more data you put in, the more precise your predictions will become. However, all historical data sets have bias. For example, if you feed in data on who has gotten a mortgage in the past in the United States and ask the computer to make similar decisions in the future, you will get an AI that offers mortgages to more white people than people of color. AI needs to be regulated because it has all of the flaws of any human process plus some. My own regulatory vision begins with frameworks, high-level governance models that guide a company's use of AI and data. A company can make sure its frameworks are implemented by performing regular algorithmic audits, ideally using a regulatory sandbox. The process could be monitored by regulators using tools we already have, namely compliance processes inside existing regulatory agencies. Agencies and companies might decide which AIs need to be regulated and monitored by looking at the user and the context. Automated license plate readers used at toll booths might be a reasonable use of AI. Automated license plate readers used by police as dragnet surveillance might be an unreasonable use of AI. An open secret in the AI world is everyone knows these systems discriminate. Any conversation about robot apocalypse is a deliberate distraction from the harms that AI systems are causing today right now. AI is preventing people from getting mortgages. A recent investigation by the markup found that nationally loan applicants of color were 40 to 80% more likely to be turned down by mortgage approval algorithms as compared to their white counterparts. When the International Baccalaureate used AI to assign student grades during the pandemic, high achieving low income students received terrible grades, which prevented them from getting college credits that would allow them to graduate early and incur less student loan debt. AI is used to generate secret predictive consumer scores, like health risk scores or identity and fraud scores. It is likely that BIPOC people are systematically disadvantaged by most of these scoring systems. The EU's proposed AI regulation calls for categorizing AI into high and low risk, which I think is a good strategy. A low risk use might be using facial recognition to unlock your phone. A high risk use might be the police using facial recognition on real time surveillance video feeds. Facial recognition has been shown to consistently misidentify people with darker skin. People of color are at a high risk of being harmed by facial recognition when it is used in policing. In the US, we could register and audit high-risk AI to ensure AI is not harming citizens. The process for uncovering an algorithmic bias is called algorithmic auditing. Orca, a company I consult with, performs bespoke algorithmic audits in context, asking how an algorithm might fail and for whom. Audits can show how an algorithm might be racist or sexist or ableist or might discriminate illegally. Once we identify a problem, it can be addressed or the algorithm can be discarded. There's also software like Parity or Equitas or Fairness 360 that can evaluate algorithms for one of 21 known kinds of mathematical fairness. I'm enthusiastic about the potential of a regulatory sandbox, a protected environment where companies can test their algorithms for bias. If and when the bias is discovered, they can then address the issue in their code and rerun the test until they're in compliance with acceptable thresholds. I'm currently working with Orca to develop a regulatory sandbox prototype. 
In our version, regulators would also have a limited view inside the sandbox to see that companies are auditing their algorithms for bias and fixing the problems that they find without the companies revealing any trade secrets. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on this important topic, and I welcome your questions. Uh, thank you, Ms. Broussard. And I have to say I'm fascinated with the thought of figuring out which of the 21 definitions of fairness you'll be advocating for. Um, we are, and next we have um, Ms. Vogel. Um, and you are now recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony. Chairman Foster, Ranking Member Gonzalez, and distinguished members of the task force, thank you for conducting this important hearing and for the opportunity to provide this testimony. My name is Miriam Vogel. I'm president and CEO of Equal AI, a nonprofit founded to reduce unconscious bias in AI systems. At Equal AI, we are AI net positive. We believe AI is and will be a powerful tool to advance our lives, economy, and opportunities to thrive, but only if we are vigilant to ensure that AI that we use does not perpetuate and mass produce historical and new forms of bias and discrimination. We're at a critical juncture. AI is becoming increasingly an important part of our daily lives, but decades of progress made and lives lost to promote equal opportunity can be unwritten in a few lines of code. And the perpetrators of this disparity may not even realize the harm they're causing. For instance, we can see our country's long history of housing discrimination now replicated at scale in mortgage approval, approval algorithms that determine credit worthiness using proxies for race and class. At Equal AI, we try to help avoid such harms by supporting three main stakeholders, companies, policymakers, and lawyers. Often our work involves helping organizations understand they're effectively AI companies because they're now using AI in pivotal functions. As such, they need an AI governance plan, particularly given that with AI, as you know, key assessments occur behind the proverbial black box where inputs and operations are generally unknown to the end user. As discussed in your past hearings, Implicit bias infiltrates AI in a variety of ways. Our operating thesis is that bias can embed in each of the human touch points throughout the AI lifecycle. From the ideation phase, deciding what the problem is you even want to solve with AI, to the design, data collection, development, testing, and monitoring phases. But we're optimistic, and we think each touch point is also an opportunity to identify and eliminate harmful biases. As such, risk management should occur at each stage of the AI lifecycle. There are several helpful frameworks to identify and reduce harms in the AI systems, including GAOs, GSAs, and the important efforts underway at NIST. The Equal AI framework offers five pillars to consider when establishing responsible AI governance, including, first, invest in the pipeline. Our basic tenet is that AI needs to be created by and for a broader cross-section of our population. There are several organizations promoting diversity in tech effectively right now. AI and you, AI for all, and several others, and we need to support these efforts. Two, hire and promote with your values. To create and sustain a diverse workplace and produce better AI, AI programs used in HR functions should be checked routinely to ensure they're in sync with the values of your organization and our country. Three, evaluate your data. The more we know about data sets, the safer we are as a society. We encourage identifying gaps in data so that they can be rectified and in a minimum clarified for end users. Four, test your AI. AI should be checked for bias on a routine basis. As you know, AI constantly iterates and learns new patterns as it is fed new data. On our website, equalai.org, we offer a checklist to help get you started and offer additional steps to take in our written testimony. We highly recommend as well use of routine audits. Five, redefine the team. An often overlooked opportunity to reduce bias in AI is by creating testing teams that include those underrepresented in the AI creation and the underlying data sets. There are numerous ways that Congress can play a key role in ensuring more effective, inclusive AI. Several are listed in our testimony. A few include, one, Congress can reinforce the applicability of laws prohibiting discrimination to AI-supported determinations. Two, Congress can lead by example create a framework for AI procurement, acquisition, development, ask vendors if they do the same. Three, incentivize investment in the future of work. Like all transformative technologies, AI will eliminate jobs, but it will also open up opportunities. To lead in the AI revolution, safeguard our economy, 
and support greater prosperity among more communities, we should reskill our workforce by understanding what jobs are likely to emerge, offering incentives for upskilling and loan forgiveness for those committing a term to public service. Finally, we enth enthusiastically support the Bill of Rights put forward by the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy last week to level set expectations and inform the public about their rights. In conclusion, we believe we're at a critical juncture to ensure that AI is built by and for a broader cross section of our population. It's not only the right thing to do, a strong US economy and our leadership depend on it. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you, Ms. Vogel. And I uh, echo your enthusiasm for the White House's effort to come up with an AI Bill of Rights, though I, um, I don't believe I've seen even a draft of it at this point. Um, uh, Ms. King, you are now recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony. Thank you, Chairman Foster, Ranking Member Gonzalez, and members of the AI Task Force for inviting me to testify today. My name is Meg King. I'm the director of the Science and Technology Innovation Program at the Wilson Center, a nonpartisan think tank created by Congress nearly 60 years ago. My program studies the policy opportunities and challenges of emerging technologies, investigates methods to foster more open science, and builds serious games. We also offer hands-on training programs called the Technology Labs to congressional and executive branch staff on a variety of issues, including artificial intelligence. Next month, we will offer a series of individual trainings on AI for members as well. As with any technological evolution, the benefits of AI come with associated costs and risks. Focusing only on the benefits misses the nuances of the potentials and pitfalls of this advance. To help the committee understand the risks to any industry, and in particular, the financial services industry, I'll focus my remarks on the nature of AI generally to understand the environment in which creation is occurring. Today, there aren't significant incentives for the private sector to include ethics directly in the development process. At the current pace of advancement, companies cannot afford to develop slowly, or a competitor might be able to bring a similar product to market faster. Largely due to consumer trust concerns, international organizations, regions, and private companies have all begun to issue ethical frameworks for AI. Most are very vague principles, as you mentioned, Chairman Foster, with little guidance as to application. Two that this committee should pay close attention to are those of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development and the European Commission. In addition to their principles on AI, the OECD's developing process and technical guidelines ranging from pinpointing new research to making available software advances, which will become part of a publicly available interactive tool for developers and policymakers alike. As Ms. Broussard noted, European regulators announced a risk-based plan this year to establish transparency requirements, including biometric identification and chatbots. Chatbots in particular are expected to have a significant impact on the financial services industry as many companies see value in customer service process improvement and the prospect of gaining more insight into customer needs in order to sell more financial products. As developers more questions about the ethics of their AI systems, they have the potential to slow the process, which could cost businesses money. However, if ethical concerns are identified too late in the development process, companies could face considerable financial uh, loss if not addressed properly. No ethical AI framework should be static, as AI systems will continue to evolve, as will our interaction with them. Key components, however, should be consistent, and that list specifically for the financial sector should include explainability, data inputs, testing, and system lifecycle. Also known as XAI, explainability is the method to ask questions about the outcomes of AI systems and how they achieve them. It helps developers and policymakers identify problems and failures, possible sources of bias, and help users access explanations. There are a number of techniques available to carry out XAI, as well as open source tools, which make these techniques more accessible. In the financial sector, XAI will become critical as predictive models increasingly perform calculations during live transactions, for example, to evaluate risk or opportunity of offering a financial product or specific transaction to a customer. Establishing a clear process for XAI will be critical to address flaws identified in these real-time systems and should be an area of focus for the committee. Additionally, producing policies or how these systems will be used and in what context will be helpful. Without context, data pulled from a mix of public-private records can produce inaccurate results and discriminate access to financial products. One of the near-term questions this committee should ask about systems you'll encounter in your oversight is how will COVID-19 pandemic experiences factor into these systems? One promising possibility to address the data input problem might be to synthesize artificial financial data to correct for inaccurate or biased historical data. Just today, a major tech company announced acquisition of a synthetic data startup. Watch this space. While quality assurances 
Part of most development processes, there are currently no enforceable standards for testing AI systems, and therefore testing is uneven at best. Additionally, users are far removed from AI system developers, carefully assessing the growing field of ML ops and machine learning operations and identifying ways the committee can participate in that process will be useful. AI breaks often in unpredictable ways at unpredictable times. Participants in the Wilson Center's AI lab have seen AI function spectacularly using a deep learning language model to produce the first ever AI drafted legislation, as well as fail when a particular image loaded into a publicly available generative adversarial network produced a distorted picture of a monster rather than a human. Lab learners also study why accuracy levels matter as they use a toy supply chain optimization model to predict whether and why a package will arrive on time and how to improve the prediction by changing the variables used such as product weight and month of purchase. Beyond mistakes, some AI systems carry out tasks in way humans never would. Many examples exist of scenarios producing results developers didn't intend, like a vacuum cleaner injecting collected dust so it can collect even more, and a racing boat in a digital game looping in place to collect points instead of winning the race. Anyone who's played the game 20 questions understands this problem. Unless you ask exactly the right question, you won't get the right answer. As more and more AI systems are built and distributed widely with varying levels of user expertise, this problem will continue. Establishing a framework of ethics for the development, distribution, and deployment of AI systems will help spot potential problems and provide more trust in them. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. King. And Mr. Yong, you are now recognized for five minutes to give a presentation of your testimony. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Foster, Ranking Member Gonzalez, and distinguished members of the task force. My name is Jeffrey Yong, and I'm a Principal Advisor at the Financial Stability Institute of the Bank for International Settlements, or the BIS. I offer my remarks today entirely in my personal capacity based on a publication that I co-authored with my colleague Jeremy Pranio entitled FSI Insights number 35, Humans Keeping AI in Check, Emerging Regulatory Expectations in the Financial Sector. Now, the views expressed in that paper are our own and do not necessarily represent those of the BIS, its members, uh, or the Basel Bay's uh, committees. I'm appearing before the task force voluntarily and would like to note that my statements here today are similarly my personal views and they do not represent the official views of the BIS, its members or the Basel-based committees. Uh, by way of background, the Financial Stability Institute or the FSI is a unit within the BIS with a mandate to support implementation of global uh, regulatory standards and sound supervisory practices by central banks and financial sectors, uh, supervisory and regulatory authorities worldwide. One of the ways uh, the FSI carries out this mandate is through its policy implementation work, which involves publishing FSI Insights papers. The papers aim to contribute to international discussions on a range of contempor contemporary regulatory and supervisory policy issues and implementation challenges faced by financial sector authorities. In preparing FSI Insights number 35, uh, my co-author and I found that regulatory expectations on the use of uh, AI in financial services were at a nascent stage. Accordingly, we drafted a paper with uh, four key uh, objectives. Firstly, is to identify emerging common financial regulatory themes surrounding AI governance. Secondly, to assess how similar or different these common regulatory themes are viewed in the context uh, of AI vis-a-vis -vis that of traditional financial models. Thirdly, to explore how existing international financial uh, regulatory standards may uh, be applied in the context of AI governance. And finally, to examine challenges in implementing the common regulatory themes. To this end, we canvass a, a, select, uh, a selection of policy documents on AI governance issued by financial authorities or groups formed by them, as well as other cross-industry AI governance uh, guidance that apply to the financial sector. In total, we examined 19 policy documents issued by 16 uh, regional uh, and national authorities and two international organizations. Most of these documents are either discussion papers or high level principles, which underscores the fact that financial regulatory, uh, regulatory thinking in this area is at a very early stage. Now we identified five common uh, themes that recur in the policy documents that we examine. These are number one, reliability, number two, accountability, number three, transparency, number four, fairness, and finally, but not least, ethics, number five. On the theme of uh, reliability, emerging supervisory expectations 
for AI and traditional models appear to be similar. What seems to be different is that the reliability of AI models is viewed from the perspective of avoiding harm to data subjects or consumers, for example, through discrimination. Secondly, on the, uh, on the theme of accountability, it is acknowledged that both traditional and AI models require human intervention. In the case of AI, however, this requirement is motivated by the need to make sure that decisions based on AI models do not result in unfair or unethical outcomes. Moreover, external accountability is emphasized in the case of AI models so that data subjects are aware of AI-driven decisions and have channels, channels for recourse. Moving now to transparency. Supervisory expectations related to explainability and auditability are similar for AI and traditional models. However, expectations on external disclosure are unique to AI models. This refers to expectations that firms use AI models, uh, that uh, firms using AI models should make data subjects aware of AI-driven decisions that impact them, including how their data is being used. On the theme of fairness, there's a distinct and strong emphasis in emerging supervisory expectations on this aspect in the case of AI models. Fairness is commonly described uh, in the documents as being avoiding discriminatory outcomes. Similarly, on ethics, there's a distinct and strong emphasis on this aspect in AI models. Ethics expectations are broader than fairness um, related to ascertaining that consumers will not be exploited or harmed. Now, given the uh, similarities of the themes between AI and traditional models, existing financial regulatory standards that govern the use of traditional models may be applied in, in the context of AI. However, there may be scope to do more in defining financial regulatory expectations related to fa fairness and ethics. Uh, the use in, of AI in financial sector presents certain challenges, uh, and a key challenge is, uh, relates to the level of complexity and lack of explain explainability. Uh, given these uh, challenges, one way to approach this is to consider a tailored and coordinated regulatory and supervisory approach, meaning differentiating prudential and conduct treatment depending on the risk that, uh, that the AI models pose. With that, I conclude. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yang. And Mr. Cooper, you're now recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Chairman Foster, Ranking Member Gonzalez, and members of the AI Task Force. My name is Aaron Cooper. I'm Vice President of Global Policy for BSA, the Software Alliance. BSA is the leading advocate for the global enterprise software industry. Our members are at the forefront of developing cutting edge data-driven services that have a significant impact on U.S. job creation. I commend the task force for convening today's important hearing, and I thank you for the opportunity to testify. Enterprise software services, including AI, are accelerating digital transformation in every sector of the economy. And BSA members are on the leading edge, providing businesses with the trusted tools they need to leverage the benefits of AI. In fact, last year, software supported more than 12.5 million jobs outside the tech sector. AI is not just about robots, self-driving vehicles, or social media. It's used by businesses of all sizes to improve their competitiveness. It's the power in industrial design that improves manufacturing performance and reduces environmental impact. It's the tool that streamlines transportation and logistics operations that detects cyber attacks and improves HR operations. In the financial services industry, AI is being used to reduce the risk of fraudulent transactions, and deliver a better customer relations experience. While the adoption of AI can unquestionably be a force for good, it can also create real risks if not developed and deployed responsibly. We commend the task force for its work to explore domestic and international AI frameworks because they play a critical role in ensuring the responsible use of AI. As you explore these issues, we offer our perspective on a risk management approach to bias, which has been a particular focus for BSA and that we hope will also inform the broader conversation. For BSA members, earning trust and confidence in AI and other software services they develop is crucial. So confronting the risk of bias is a priority. We therefore set out to develop concrete steps companies can take to guard against this. The resulting framework is included in full in my written testimony. It's built on three key elements, impact assessments, risk mitigation practices, and organizational accountability. Modeled on NIST frameworks, it includes more than 50 actionable diagnostic statements for performing impact assessments that identify risks of bias and corresponding best practices for mitigating those risks. Among the unique features of the BSA framework is that it recognizes these, these steps need to be followed at all stages of the AI lifecycle, design, development, and deployment phases. 
Also, different businesses will have different roles throughout the life cycle. So risk management responsibility will need to be tailored to a company's role, who is developing the algorithm, who is collecting the data, training the model, and ultimately deploying the system. What does that all mean in practice? A few examples. First, when designing an AI system, companies should clearly define the intended use and what the system is optimized to predict, identify who may be impacted, and if the risk of bias is present, document efforts to mitigate that risk. They should examine data that will be used to train the model to ensure it's representative and not tainted by historical biases. Second, at the development stage, they should document choices made in selecting features for the model and document how the model was tested. Third, at the deployment phase, they should document the process for monitoring the data and model and maintain a feedback mechanism to enable consumers to report concerns. And to be clear, at every phase, it's important for companies to have a team that brings diverse perspectives and background, which can help anticipate the needs and concerns of people who may be affected by AI in order to identify potential sources of bias. Bias is only one of the important ethical considerations for responsible AI, but addressing it is critical. And the risk management approach we recommend in this context can be tailored to address other ethical considerations. In conclusion, Digital transformation across industry sectors is creating jobs and improving our lives. But industry, civil society, and academia must work together with Congress and other policymakers on guidelines and laws that will ensure companies act responsibly in how they develop and deploy AI. We appreciate the task force and strong focus on these issues and hope that our framework on confronting bias will contribute meaningfully to this discussion. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. And the chair will now recognize myself for five minutes for questions. Uh, so my first general question um, uh, to Ms. King or Mr. Cooper, whoever wants to field it, is how much should we expect of AI? And in particular, should we be asking more of AI than we do of humans um, you know, for AI-driven cars? Uh, should the standard be that you should outperform humans on average or in all circumstances with similar, you know, similar things when, regarding fairness as well. Um, you, you know, is it in general, is it reasonable? Or are there real dangers in using human-based decision-making as the standard of fairness and safety for what's acceptable in AI? I'm happy to jump in. Uh, I, sure. I give what, one example, a uh, way of thinking about this is that things that are illegal in the physical world should be legal in the um, digital world when you use AI or any other system. So in the realm of discrimination, for instance, a practice that would be discriminatory if a person did it should still be discriminatory and illegal um, if an AI system does it. And I think what we're finding in other areas is that AI is increasingly being used um, both in uh, everyday features of, um, of what companies are doing as they go through a digital transformation but will also increasingly be used in more high risk areas. And in those situations, we need to make sure that there's a proper impact assessment so we know whether it's related to bias or safety or another issue, companies are thinking through what those implications are going to be and take steps to mitigate those risks. I'm, I'm happy to answer if you'd like as well. I, I think the answer is honestly, we don't know. Um, certain systems are designed very narrowly right now, and that's because AI outperforms humans in those systems. Um, but in others, with context, with heuristics, the shortcuts that we use as humans, they don't perform well. Uh, and as one of the Wilson Center machine learning researchers um, has written a paper about and reminds regularly, autonomous agents optimize the reward function that we give them. And so until, um, <laughs> until we can improve AI um, to a level where we feel comfortable that moves beyond that narrow capability, I don't think we have an answer yet about how to think about the uh, the consequences, but also the opportunities. They are just so varied across so many sectors at this point. Any other comments on this? I mean, just, you know, the deployment decision that has to be made here. Uh, you need some sort of absolute standard that this is good enough for this application. And, and it's something we're going to have to face because that's probably at best the level at which Congress will be specific about, you know, how, how these decisions should be set up. Um, and so another thing that, that I know we all struggle with is this question of, 
of black box testing versus having expecting that the public should have a detailed understanding of what goes on inside. You know, you look at the trouble that we've had trying to convince people to get vaccinated. And it's not clear that it helps to tell them the details of how the immune system in the human works. Uh, and, and, you know, that may make it better, maybe make it worse. You know, we had, we had this situation uh, very recently where we, you know, we apparently fired a football coach, not to my knowledge, for mistreating uh, athletes, but for what went on in his private decision making. I mean, should we, should we accept or reject the algorithms based only on their inputs and outputs? Or should we actually demand to look inside at all the intermediate levels of the neural network and see if there are objectionable racist nodes in them? Um, what is your thinking on that, the black box versus the detail, and also how to convey that to the public? Anyone? Should I just pick someone at random? <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to jump in. Um, okay. I think it's a great question. And I think that uh, the challenge, it also includes that even if you showed the general public all of the nodes, uh, it wouldn't necessarily make sense. In this case, you wouldn't know which are prioritized. Uh, so there is a balance to strike. There's intellectual property issues, uh, privacy issues, and so forth. Uh, and so just opening the box, first of all, would be somewhat technically challenging as well as legally. Um, but I do think that there can be uh, compliance testing, as you say, can be a helpful way uh, to demonstrate compliance, safety, legality. Uh, and to the extent that more data becomes available, we don't need to expect everyone in the general public to understand it. We have seen so many cases already where the limited public available data has been used for important findings, like with the United Healthcare Optum case, where scientists, researchers were able to build backwards, look at the algorithms and identify biases in the algorithms. Thank you. And when you figure all this stuff out, uh, let us know. Uh, and the chair will now recognize the ranking member, Representative Gonzalez of Ohio, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Foster, and, and thank you to our witnesses. Ms. Vogel, I'm going to try to pick up where, where Chairman Foster just left off on, on compliance testing. Um, is it fair to say, based on the response you gave, that the right way to think about this is more to look at the outputs of AI as opposed to opening up the hood and trying to understand each individual node and neural network? Is, is that the right way to think about it? My view? view is that it should be a balance. I think that absolutely the outputs are indicative. Uh, they are helpful to look at now because so much of the AI is already deployed. Um, and so we're not at the design stages for so much of the AI in common use. And for that, um, understanding what it is what the outputs are is, is important and helpful. I think there are elements of what is under the hood that would be helpful and important to understand, particularly when you're talking about AI used in pivotal sensitive functions. So um, I don't think it's one or the other. I do think it's a balance, but uh, no matter what, I think the outputs are very uh, important to be testing and, and, and watching. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And I, I think it's, as I mentioned in my opening statement, um, it's encouraging that we're seeing some AI algorithms produce better results, significantly better results in some instances uh, from a bias standpoint. Um, and, and obviously the hope is to understand what it is that they're doing right and, and doing more of that or making that more transparent uh, and then helping foster a, a more collaborative innovation environment. Um, Ms. King, I, I wanna shift to you and, and I wanna ask about transparency in AI algorithms. Also, as I mentioned in my opening statement, the use of algorithms in social media has had a detrimental effect on young users, which as a parent, I, I find extremely problematic. Um, do you think that more can be done to ensure parents have additional transparency about their child's data being collected by these apps or their own? Uh, and how can we strike the right balance, the right line between encouraging in, in innovation, managing problematic algorithms, and providing data sovereignty to, to users? Uh, well, thank you, sir. Uh, as a parent as well, this is that's the one thing that terrifies me is is my children getting access to to these capabilities. Uh, and unfortunately, I wish there was a, a, a one significant answer that could fix it. But it's going to be um, a constant, ever moving um, group of things that we have to do. And explainability has is, is significant in that um, problem. 
because we have to both, as Miriam just said, we have to understand what the outputs are, but we have to understand enough about how they are getting there um, to, to be able to make informed decisions about whether there's too much data that's being collected or whether there isn't. And there are many ways to do this. One of the most popular is this um, local interpretable model agnostic explanation. This was created by the University of Washington to try to see what happens inside. So model agnostic, it should be um, across models. So that, that's one of many ways to do that. Um, another piece to this is, as you just mentioned, there, you know, AI can be positive and there are some um, impressive advances happening right now in synthetic data that can both help hopefully correct for some of those historical data biases, but also give just a, a better picture uh, of, of, um, of the people that are going to be impacted by the system being created. Now, of course, you've got to understand what that synthetic data looks like. So you probably should have a wide group of interdisciplinary experts assessing that to make sure you're not missing something. But I think it's a combination of constantly reviewing the outcomes, constantly trying to take um, at least a sample of, uh, of, of, of explainability across some of the most important high risk, as the Europeans are suggesting high risk models. And then also assessing kind of what are the new technical capabilities that we are developing now that can help address this problem. Thank you. Um, shifting to, sorry, <laughs> shifting to, to Mr. Cooper for a second um, with my final minute, I want to ask you about the BSA AI risk management framework included in your testimony. One aspect that seems to be of importance is that a one size fits all framework will not work for small companies and startups. I completely agree. Uh, could you elaborate on why flexibility in any framework is important for fostering innovation? Sure. So thank you. Thank you very much. So um, I think it's important to have flexibility in, in, in a variety of ways of achieving a desired outcome for a number of reasons, including that not all systems are going to be used for the same purposes. So the, uh, the algorithm and the data that's used to determine what uh, shows our kids watch or what videos our kids watch online is one form of algorithm and one use of AI, but there's also database management and customer relations management tools and uh, farmers that use AI in order to improve crop yields. And one set of regulations across the board isn't going to be able to be flexible enough to address the, the range of different use cases for AI. Yeah, thank you. And I also think it's, it's almost always the case that the higher the regulatory burden, the more you entrench incumbents and the less innovation you have at the startup level uh, as the regulatory burden is just too high to even contemplate a startup. So uh, with that, I, I thank the witnesses and I yield back. Thank you. And we will now recognize Ms. Presley of Massachusetts for five minutes of questions. Uh, thank you, Chair Foster, for convening this important hearing and to our witnesses for joining us here today. Um, certainly, systemic racial discrimination is widespread in the financial services industry. The damage of redlining, banking deserts, and employment discrimination has never been fully redressed or repaired in America, and all the data supports those facts. Today, mortgage lenders deny Black applicants at a rate 80% higher than white applicants, and payday lenders continue to target low-income people of color, charging 500% interest even in the midst of a pandemic. Many believe uh, artificial intelligence presents an opportunity to make the allocation of credit and risk fairer and more inclusive. However, AI technology and machine learning can easily go in the other direction and exacerbate existing bias, reinforcing bias credit allocation and making discrimination and lending even harder to prove. Cases of racial bias in AI are well documented and have impacted everything from mortgage loans and tenant screening to student loans. The deciding factor between whether the technology has a positive or damaging impact could be its developers. And Ms. Broussard, who is writing the algorithms, the algorithms that are being used to make important financial decisions like credit worthiness? Do the teams writing these algorithms generally reflect the diversity of people in America? Generally, these teams do not represent, represent the diversity of people in America. Uh, Silicon Valley and its developers tend to be very pale male and Yale. 
Uh, compared to overall private industry, the EEOC found that the high tech sector employed a larger share of whites, Asian Americans, and men, and a smaller share of African Americans, Hispanics, and women. Thank you. Uh, in fact, in February 2020, the Financial Services Committee released a report on the diversity of America's largest banks, which found that banks were largely undiversified at all levels and departments, which those uh, data points you offered there uh, support that. Ms. Broussard, uh, one more question. Will this lack of diversity affect AI used by financial institutions? What's the impact? Absolutely, yes, there's an impact. Uh, so the problem is that people tend to embed their unconscious biases in the technology that they create. So when we have a small and homogeneous group of people creating AI, that AI uh, then uh, gets the collective blind spots of the community of people who are creating the algorithms. Uh, so the more diversity you have in the in the room when you're creating algorithms, the uh, the better the algorithm is going to be uh, for the wide variety of people who live in America. Uh, thank you, Ms. Prasad. And just to, to further unpack uh, uh, the impact of that on people's lives, uh, there are many different facets of AI that companies developing these technologies really need to consider. From as we're speaking to here, who is developing the algorithms to the AI's impact on job loss. A recent report from the World Economic Forum predicted that by 2025, the next wave of automation amplified by the pandemic will disrupt 85 million jobs globally. Uh, Ms. Vogel, what role should independent auditors play in helping to assess the human cost and the ethical implications of AI technologies so that both developers and the public can fully understand the ethical impacts these technologies have for actual consumers? Thank you for that question. It's a really important point. Uh, we do have this growing body of experts. In fact, we have one on this very panel who do this important work of, of checking in, of taking the temperature and understanding where these gaps are. Uh, I think it's really important that we build our, uh, our reliance and, and our, our uh, infrastructure to support more algorithmic auditing uh, because these are the people who will tell us uh, is the AI doing what we expect it to? Are we discriminating? Are we creating opportunity? Uh, who, for whom will this fail and how do we create more opportunity through our algorithms? Thank you. Uh, I agree. Frequent and independent audits are critical. AR supported uh, recommendations in the financial services industry directly impact people's lives as along with economic opportunities. And yet the data the algorithms use are trained on data that is rife with imbalance and discrimination. So as we, as we do the work uh, deliberately to enact long overdue economic injustice, we can't allow the AI industry to create new problems and to compound these already persistent um, and deeply embedded inequities. Uh, thank you, and I yield back. Um, thank you, and we will now recognize Mr. Laudermilk from Georgia for five minutes. Whoops, and I believe you're muted. Now. Yep. yep. Okay, thanks. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. There's one thing important to keep in mind uh, as we discuss AI is the types of bias we need to eliminate and the types of bias that actually we want to keep. Sometimes the main purpose of an algorithm is to be biased. For example, in loan underwriting, uh, it, algorithms are generally used to distinguish between who can uh, pay back a loan and, and who's not able to pay back a loan. With that in mind, we must work toward eliminating the types of bias that have no place in our financial system, such as the bias based on race or gender or any other, other factor like that. One important way of doing that is when an algorithm is being built, there should be a thorough record keeping of everything that is added to the algorithm. That way, if bias is suspected, companies and regulators can see everything that went into the algorithm and see where the bias may be coming from. I think this would help make, make it where algorithm Algorithms are not a black box, but where out and where the out the outputs cannot be explained, but you would have record where you could see where the problems may be. Uh, Mr. Cooper, 
Your organization's framework for AI best practices recommends maintaining records of the data that is used to train AI models. I agree with that. Expanding on that, do you believe that maintaining thorough records of all the inputs used to build an algorithm can be useful for identifying the source of any unwanted bias? Thank you very much, Congressman. Yeah, I, I think it goes even beyond what the data is. I think that there's um, a whole set of considerations that companies need to go through to figure out whether there's a high risk that um, the AI system as it's intended to be deployed or as it's being deployed may have consequential impacts on people. And the decision-making about what those risks are and what the right mitigation practices are, how the data was tested, um, what historical biases may or may not be present in them, keeping a, a, a record of that as part of a risk management framework can be both useful in, or, in order to make sure that companies are not putting systems out into the world um, or using systems that are going to lead to discriminatory results, but it can also be useful, as you say, after the fact, if there is a problem, to go back and audit and find out why it happened and make sure it doesn't happen again. Yeah, Representative Lauder Milk, I believe you're muted still. Um, All right, I don't know why it's yeah. cutting off like that. Can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, yes, we can. And, and okay. feel free to, to exceed your time by 40 seconds. All right, thank you. Mr. Young, in your testimony, you discussed the importance of accountability and transparency in AI. Can maintaining records when algorithms are being built help achieve those goals? Yes, accountability um, is, is very important, um, especially when it comes to AI. And without, without record keeping, there's no transparency. And in our paper, we mentioned that transparency is a prerequisite to, uh, to enabling uh, financial institutions to meet the other um, general uh, AI governance principles. And, and in, if, if, if the AI model is not transparent, then it is very difficult to assess whether it's reliable, whether it's sound, whether it's uh, whether there's bias uh, involved. So definitely, record keeping is a prerequisite to uh, meeting this accountability uh, general principle. Thank you for that, Ms. King. You've written that policymakers must govern AI in a way that is flexible enough to adapt when technology inevitably changes, which we know it continually changes in in today's environment. I agree with that, and I believe that is that that is needed to have an environment that fosters innovation. Um, with that in mind, how can policymakers ensure that AI governance remains flexible but robust at the same time? Thank you, sir, for that question. Uh, and I think it it's all about um, having uh, a set of goals that are measurable and achievable. So one of them is how can you explain these systems? And again, the complexity here is really because these systems cross so many sectors. Um, yours obviously is financial services, so you have some very specific use cases to identify, which is helpful, but you need to be able to explain those specific use cases. You need to under ask a lot of questions and those questions will change too, but the big ones are, why was it developed? What are the, how does it possibly fail? Because it's that failure mode that the unexpected failure that is really um, a lot of the problem here. And then again, how can we correct those errors and report them? So uh, it, if you can kind of have those four, four ways of addressing this, this challenge, uh, then, and you work with uh, companies and you work with both governments who are buying this and the companies who are producing this uh, to, to have that sort of uh, the, the four methods of regularly checking that you're getting what you're producing what you want, you're getting what you want out of it, and that it, it is not discriminatory, then, then I think that's a flexible way to move forward. Uh, and, and I think the sandbox um, concept that Ms. Broussard has suggested is also very helpful because while records are great and it's easy for us to say, let's keep records here. If you've ever taken a look at the code behind some of these systems, it's it's and how often it changes as you as you shift weights, it's it gets pretty complicated pretty quickly. And so the more you can have these kinds of places where companies and organizations can feel safe um, testing is is going to be critical going forward. 
Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. And we'll now recognize Representative Kasten for five minutes. Thank you so much. I, I, I want to follow on. I think Mr. Loudermilk really hit it on the head with the transparency question. I want to follow on that. It, but I want to specifically get to the auditability issue. It's one thing, and I think I think you alluded to this, uh, Ms. King. It's it's one thing to be able to see the code. It's something else completely to be able to understand the code. Um, the And I say this as someone who, before I came to Congress, ran a utility. And my biggest risk was predicting revenue because did it vary with the weather? Did it vary with economic conditions? And I built an algorithm, a genetic algorithm that figured all that stuff out. I have no idea how it worked, um, but it was but it was amazingly effective and it made our investors much happier because we could predict our revenue. That's trivial. It's not at all implausible for me to imagine that we get to a world where an investment fund has figured out from looking at global data that there's about to be a massive human rights abuse commit, committed and, and is shorting the affected businesses and properties, right? And that would be deeply unethical. And if we understood it, it would be a problem, but it's totally possible that we could never actually understood that, Stand, that's what it's doing. And so my, my question, and I think I, all of you can answer this, but I'm gonna start with Ms. King, just because I see you nodding so vociferously. Um, what is the best regulatory practice for A, ensuring that these algorithms remain auditable and B, ensuring that they apply to everyone in the system? Because presumably as soon as some subset of people agree to have auditable algorithms, people who violate that might, might have an investing edge, right? So when, whether that's a bad actor in our, in our country or a foreign actor who wishes us harm. Um, what's that standard, both domestically and internationally? How would you recommend we think about that? Thank you, sir. I'll take a quick stab at it. And I'm going to use a hypothetical because I think it's always helpful to have it. Yours is very complicated, and I'm not going to try and explain your um, very impressive example. But so at the Wilson Center, um, in one of our trainings, we use a supply chain um, prediction model. Will it or won't it arrive? Will the USPS deliver a package on time? And you have um, you have a series of variables uh, you have product weight, you have um, the month that it was ordered, you have things that you probably as a consumer wouldn't think matter, but about 10 different variables. And as you play with the model and you change the variables, you change the weights, how much weight do we give to a particular variable or not, you understand more why uh, the, the prediction you get comes out. And then you can kind of take that and you can go back through the system and, and check it. I would say you need some, you need a, a couple of standards that one is not going to work, unfortunately, but a couple of standards that have that sort of ability to use a couple of methods, probably a model agnostic method, if it's possible, um, to go back and just understand at least at a, a strategic level. You may not be able, as you know very well, to go and explain the whole thing, but a, a confidence level uh, of, of an explainability that, that you could achieve. So you're looking for some sort of confidence trust level and in, in some sort of um, agnostic model verification. Uh, and you're also looking to make sure as you're going through that process that you have um, a number of, if you're going to have regulators as part of this conversation, a number of regulators across sectors. I don't, as your example points out, you can't just have financial services um, regulators. You're going to have to have others from other parts of the government at the table because there will be these unexpected outcomes. If, if I if I could though, that that approach you describe works where there's a, a finite number of known inputs. If you're using sort of a neural network model that, for all practical yeah. purposes, has has an infinite number of inputs, I don't know how you audit right. that at some level of complexity. Um, the um, to follow on from that, and, and I'm sure this varies market to market. Is, is there any good analysis of is there is there a percentage of algorithmic trading that or algorithmic investing wherever it sits that beyond we really don't want to have more than X percent because now the algorithms are responding to algorithms. Is there is there a robust mathematical way to think about that? And maybe it's different for housing credit decisions than it is for equities investments for something else. But is there some robust way to think about that so that we don't sort of unwittingly introduce too much volatility into the system? And if any of the other witnesses want to chime in on this, I'd be welcome for your thoughts as well. Um, so I can speak to uh, auditing algorithms. Uh, mm -hmm. What we want to do is uh, we don't want to think about auditing all algorithms to the same standard. We want to think about auditing algorithms in context uh, because the context matters a lot. 
Uh, so we do need to keep track of inputs. We do need explainability. We do need to enforce real world uh, laws inside algorithms. We do need to uh, be aware of bias in, bias out. And so to your point about thresholds, uh, the acceptable thresholds would be determined based on the context. I see I'm out of time, but I uh, would welcome any of the, your further thoughts offline from any of the witnesses and I yield back. Uh, thank you. And we will now recognize uh, Ms. Adams of North Carolina for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Chair Foster. Thank you, Ranking Member Gonzalez and Chairwoman Waters for, for this hearing today. And to our witnesses, thank you for your testimony. Uh, Professor uh, Broussard, uh, in your testimony, you noted that all historical data sets have bias and that uh, a, AI needs to be regulated as soon as possible because it has all of the flaws of any human process plus more. You also cite in your testimony the potential impact of bias in AI to students and consumers of lower socioeconomic status, such as when the International Baccalaureate Organization used AI to assign grades to students to, the, to their detriment. So building off of what my colleague, Ms. Presley, discussed, would you tell us more about what happened in these scenarios? Sure, thank you for that question. Uh, so the International Baccalaureate example uh, is a situation where because of the pandemic, the International Baccalaureate exams were canceled and the IB decided to use an algorithm to assign imaginary grades to real students. Uh, which had disastrous consequences because the inputs to the algorithm were things like uh, a school's performance in the past. Well, we know that uh, schools, uh, we know that the economic divide is particularly profound when it comes to America's schools. Uh, and so the poor schools, the students at the poor schools were predicted to do poorly and the students at the rich schools were predicted to do well. Uh, we have a racial divide there. Who are the students at poor schools? They're mostly black and brown students. Who are the students at rich schools? Well, they're mostly white students. So the algorithm made very predictable uh, decisions that disadvantaged black and brown and poor students. Uh, wow. This is what happens most of the time with algorithmic mm -hmm. decisions. So would you explain what algorithmic uh, auditing is and how we can encourage public and private entities to adapt it as a best practice. Oh, th thank you. Yeah, so algorithmic auditing, uh, as I mentioned in my testimony, uh, is something that I do with a company called Orca, O'Neill Risk Consulting and Algorithmic Auditing. Uh, what we do is we look at an algorithm uh, and we ask, uh, who could this algorithm uh, negatively affect? Uh, and we look at the inputs to the algorithm. We do look at the code. Uh, we act as an information fiduciary, so we keep everything uh, extremely private. Uh, we look at the outputs and uh, we do mathematical and statistical analysis as necessary in order to figure out what is going on in the algorithm. Once you actually figure out where the algorithm is going wrong, you can fix it. But in a lot of industries now, uh, people are pretending that there's nothing wrong. So for example, uh, Ms. Vogel mentioned before the uh, Optum case. Uh, there's also the uh, case of the Apple card where uh, someone uh, was offered, a man was offered a uh, credit limit that was something like 10 times higher than his wife, even though they share all of their finances. Uh, and so companies are, are pretending that uh, they don't collect information like race in order to make decisions. But on the other hand, if you're using a factor like zip code that is an input to your algorithm, then, well, actually, we have enough re residential segregation in the United right. States that if you are using zip code, you are actually using race as a okay. proxy. So well, there thank are. You. Uh, thank you. I want to move on you. if I can real quickly. Uh, sure. Ms. Vogel, uh, I was happy to see that part of your recommendations related to diversifying AI uh, field, including supporting HBCUs. Uh, and so specifically, what should Congress be doing to ensure that HBCU and MSI students 
are able to participate in the A1 revolution currently underway? Thank you for that question. We strongly believe that we need AI to be built by and for a broader cross section of the population, uh, both so that more can benefit from the AI, so that more can benefit from the economical uh, support that comes from it, uh, but also so that our AI is better. Uh, so we need to make sure that we support HBCUs and MSIs uh, to ensure that their students are part of this current AI revolution that's underway. Uh, we know that HBCUs produce nearly 20% of all Black graduates, 25% of Black graduates who earn degrees in the disciplines of STEM, technology, science, engineering, and math. Uh, and we need to make sure that we have all hands on deck. We can't afford to not bring all of these students into the AI revolution. Industry is depending you, on their participation. I, I, think I'm, I think I'm out of time, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to yield back. But thank you very much uh, for, your, for your response. Thank you. And we will now recognize Mr. Alcoquas of Massachusetts for five minutes. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'd like to talk about two specific applications of algorithms that have been uh, and are front and center these days and, and really invite the panel to weigh in on either or, either or. The first is the use of algorithms in hiring. Uh, a number of organizations some from the center left, some from the left, some from center right, have all converged that there are somewhere between 25 to 30 million quote unquote hidden workers in the United States, people who could be employed, who under the right conditions want to be employed, and yet we're not tapping into their productivity and they're not getting to realize their fullest aspirations. That's obviously a multifaceted problem, but one element of it are algorithms that some of the biggest com <coughs> companies are using something like 75 to 80% of Fortune 100s, for example, in how they sort resumes that get uh, put forward. They are screening out resumes that have discontinuity in employment. They're screening out resumes of formerly incarcerated individuals. They're screening out uh, resumes that don't have a college degree, even for jobs that don't require a college degree. Uh, I welcome input from the panel on this first application, kind of the state of play right now in these resume screening algorithms and what can be done to improve them and whether they have any role at all going forward. Uh, I can offer that my colleague Hilke Shellman uh, has been writing about these topics uh, and has done some really excellent work in the MIT uh, technology review uh, that's an in-depth uh, in depth view on what's going on with hiring algorithms. I'd add that the, the, this is one of the reasons why we're why we need a risk management framework for when there's going to be um, an AI system that has a highly consequential impact on somebody's life. So making sure that um, there's a, a thought process that's auditable about what the factors are that are considered in determining what resume is going to go where is a good example of something where we need to make sure that there's a thought through and documented <clears throat> excuse me, impact assessment and then steps taken to, to mitigate risk. And I, I would just add also that this should be a, a triple line win for everybody. This is companies don't want to be screening out high quality workers for esoteric reasons. I mean, they're, they're struggling for employees as we speak. And as a society, we want people to be working and contributing uh, and the people themselves want meaningful work. So I would hope that this can be an area of, of actual bipartisan work going forward is, is how we encourage the private sector to be more thoughtful about their use of these hiring algorithms and, and the other elements of this, of this challenge of hidden workers. Um, the, the second area that I wanna dig into and invite the panel to speak on is about uh, what many of us have been reading about these last two weeks, which is Facebook's algorithm. The whistleblower in addressing the Senate exposited that that while she did not think Section 230 should be revised for user generated content, she did think that Facebook's algorithm itself should be subject to liability laws. And I would welcome uh, input from any of the panelists here about how how that might be applicable uh, in terms of Facebook in particular, but really any social media's algorithm, whether that should be subject to to regulation itself. So um, I'm happy to jump in again. We, we don't represent Facebook, but um, 
I'd say that I, I think it's important to make sure that where, where you have particular high risk in the way an algorithm is working. So in this case, um, feeding certain videos or certain social media feeds to certain people, particularly where it has to do with children, that's, that's a high risk. And we need to make sure that the decision making process is appropriate. And there's a combination of a regulatory aspect of that and also just a good, um, good practices internally to make sure that there's organizational accountability. So when decisions are made that, um, that there is somebody at a senior level that, that signs off on those decisions um, and that there's a documentation of, of why certain choices were made. Yeah, I can see why it would, I mean, I can see why it would be challenging to try to unpick liability for, for an algorithm that was put into place, how you can draw causality directly. And yet, Part of me thinks that we have to answer that that question. We've got to wrestle with that problem because otherwise we're going to be in a place where I think organizations will be distancing themselves from accountability instead of embracing it by being able to point towards these black box algorithms and say that they're they're just part of part of their, their toolkit and you can never paint cause and effect. I think we need to to reject that explanation and hold companies liable for the algorithms that they choose to use. I yield back my time, Mr. Chair. Oh, thank you. And I'd like to thank our witnesses for their testimony today. And without objection, all members will have five legislative days with which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you are able. Uh, without objection, all members will have five legislative days with which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. I remind members that written questions and materials for the record should be submitted to the email address provided to your offices. And this hearing is now adjourned.